I've been doing this YouTube thing coming up on about a year now, and while I've referenced it numerous times, I've yet to do a video about Elite Dangerous, one of my favorite games of all time. There are a few reasons I haven't done a video. Elite is a massive, sprawling space simulation whose complexity makes discussing its quality as a game in a single video exceedingly difficult. Elite has also, since releasing in 2014, evolved and changed drastically. The Elite I played five years ago is nowhere near the Elite I played today, mostly. Of course, Elite Elite's scope, while impressive, isn't necessarily unheard of. Cloud Imperium Games' Star Citizen is comparable and another work in progress, but I don't want to compare and contrast Elite with what might be its main competitor, at least not in this video. Instead, I'd like to compare and contrast Elite with itself, its imperfections with its awe-inspiring achievements, its beautiful mechanical intricacies with its labor-intensive idiosyncrasies. I want to talk about reasons I love Elite, and I want to talk about reasons I hate Elite, and because of its complexity, evaluating Elite also requires explaining how it works. So to begin, we'll lay out what exactly Elite is. Developed and published by Frontier Developments, Elite Dangerous is a massively multiplayer space game that takes place across a recreated Milky Way galaxy containing 400 billion star systems, each explorable and some based on real-life data. In Elite, you're not a hero, you're not the chosen one. Instead, you're just one of many player-controlled commanders, and there's not much special about you. You're a pilot for hire in a galaxy full of war, mystery, and money to be made. The majority of your time will most likely be spent in the bubble a region of space inhabited by humanity and gradually expanding as warring factions jostle over territory. There's no single player story, at least in the traditional sense. You exist and take part in a galaxy that evolves. Activities like repairing space stations or fighting off aliens have an effect on the galaxy, and some plot lines happen outside the scope of gameplay, political intrigue, or scientific discoveries. When you boot the game up for the first time, you appear in a space station with a minuscule amount of credits, the weakest vessel in the game, and a universe of possibilities. There are a few introductory tutorials, but once you're in the galaxy, there's no objective marker, destination, or reassuring voice instructing you what to do next. It's an unceremonious introduction that throws you against the learning curve you'll be scaling for hours. What you do in and outside the bubble is up to you. Perhaps you desire the life of an honest trader, hauling goods from one spaceport to the next. Maybe laser burns and shell casings are your thing. And maybe you catch yourself aimlessly adrift in the enormous galaxy map, marking points of interest, wondering what Bernard's Loop looks like close up and considering just how long it would take you to get there. Of course, for the most part, Elite doesn't just allow you to do these things. Your starting ship, a Sidewinder, will get you from point A to point B, but to really flourish in the year 3305, you'll need better gear and eventually a better ship. And getting better ships with better gear not only means climbing that learning curve, but enduring a painfully slow grind. It's important to remember Elite's status as a simulator, that it's built on a foundation of being a somewhat reasonable, grounded sci-fi universe, and this simulation makes certain elements of Elite's grind grindier. Anywhere you go, anywhere you travel, is going to take time. In fact, traveling is most of what you'll do in Elite, just flying through space. Elite has three speeds by which you'll do this traveling. Normal space, supercruise, and hyperspace. Normal space is what you'll fly around space stations and dogfight in. It's measured in meters per second and varies greatly from ship to ship. Hyperspace is what you'll use to fly between star systems, which lie light years apart, a light year being the distance light travels in a year. From a gameplay perspective, it's essentially a loading screen, if not at least a really cool loading screen. The area you see around you is known as Witch Space, a mysterious higher dimension of reality vessels use to cross massive sections of space. And yes, hyperspace is technically a place and not a speed, but just don't worry about that. Lastly, Super Cruise is Elite's standard faster than light propulsion, you'll use to travel inside and around individual star systems. All ships travel at the same speeds in supercruise, measured anywhere from kilometers per second and all the way up to hundreds, even thousands of times the speed of light. Rather than light years, star systems are often measured in light seconds, the distance light travels in a second. Elite treats supercruise and normal space like two different places. Players in supercruise can't smash into players in normal space. Star systems are realistically scaled and simulated, celestial bodies hundreds and sometimes thousands of light seconds apart, all orbiting and spinning like they would in real life. Even if you're simply transporting cargo from one space station to another, expect a good amount of downtime. Massive objects like planets and stars make accelerating in super 
seems slow, and as plotting as that can feel, the fact that star systems are realistically scaled makes it necessary. You may come across a star system with all its planets and space stations relatively close to each other, and in those instances, you may not need to get to speeds hundreds of times the speed of light to travel around. But space wasn't made for the convenience of humanity, and some star systems span across hundreds of thousands of light seconds, meaning you'll need to reach higher speeds in order to cross them. If you were able to accelerate to max speeds at any given time in supercruise, you'd uncontrollably jet across star systems without being able to slow down for your destination. I'll admit there were times I've even felt exasperated staring into Elite's massive expanses waiting for time to pass, and it's definitely annoying missing your target because you were going too fast or stopped paying attention. But Elite's scale and slow pacing isn't a downside, it's a requirement, and an appreciated one at that. Elite is a fascinating case study in the differences between taste and objective quality. It may not be a game for you, and that's obviously fine, but to achieve what Elite sets out to achieve, this scale is intrinsic, even if inconvenient. As much as I hate Elite stretches of boredom, I love its tangible sense of size, which the scale provides. Now, there are ways I think Frontier could streamline Elite's scale. For example, every time you warp into a star system, you appear just outside the system's biggest star. Most of the time, that star acts as the system's center. Space stations and the like orbit planets around that star. However, the biggest star isn't always the main star. There may be a smaller star thousands of light seconds away that, for whatever reason, happens to be where all the space stations and stuff are at, and traveling there takes a few minutes. If you ran Elite through a cost-benefit analysis, you'd find a constant problem is that costs often outweigh benefits. Economics is surprisingly a massive element to Elite as a game, and many of Elite's problems start with those economics breaking down. Space stations being minutes, in some extreme cases more than an hour, away from the system's main star is evidence. If you're, say, hauling cargo between space stations, sometimes the time it takes to travel larger distances isn't always offset by the benefit gained in the end. Why take a job that'll take forever when you could accept missions that may not pay as well, but end much faster, meaning you can more quickly move on to more missions and more money? I do believe Elite Scale is necessary. Long flights are a part of the game that need to stay, but I've never thought these extreme cases of space stations taking 15 or 20 minutes to reach are necessary. Space stations have mission boards that list all kinds of different jobs, like hunting pirates or hauling cargo, but our cost-benefit analysis rears its ugly head here, too. Sure, you could accept this mission for just under 2 million credits, but you'll have to search for and kill 10 pirates. There are other more cost-effective ways you can profit from combat more quickly. This mission's an inefficient use of time. To be fair, jobs come with other optional rewards, like valuable resources. Optional rewards rewards make missions more useful, specifically once you've put a few hours into Elite, and I appreciate the concept, but I feel there has to be a more creative, fun way to utilize these missions, as well as how these valuable resources are handed out. One great aspect of Elite's economy is that it remains untainted by microtransactions or any real money mechanics. Elite has microtransactions, but they're cosmetic only. Everything you purchase in Elite is purchased with in-game credits that you can only collect in-game. Everyone starts in the same place, and where you get to is up to you, keeping the integrity of Elite's economy and gameplay firm and authentic. You earn everything. So, once you decide what it is you want to do in the galaxy, you have to learn how to do it, and even with guides and tutorials, the best form of education is experience. The opening moments of your career as a commander are daunting. If you don't have a friend that can show you the ropes, you'll be spending a good chunk of time poring over online guides, reddit threads, and forum posts. There will be trial and error, plenty of bumps and bruises marking your interstellar journey, but that process of learning how to make your own way in Elite is among the most enjoyable and challenging learning curves I've ever experienced. You not only gain a better understanding of how Elite works as a game, but you'll feel yourself organically becoming a better pilot over time. A criticism I often see lobbed at Elite is that it lacks direction, it lacks defined goals, or that, quite simply, it lacks stuff to do. There's definitely some truth to this. Elite wants players to create their own goals, strive for whatever they consider necessary, what they consider fun, but there are times this feels futile. You can 
can organize much of what Elite offers in three pillars, combat, trading, and exploration. You can profit off of each to some extent, and they all have different paces and styles of gameplay. Combat is active, exploration, my personal favorite, is far more relaxed, and trading is sort of in between. Each pillar requires different ships and different equipment for traders. You'll need ships with more cargo space and longer jump ranges, and those looking for a fight will want stronger ships with stingy shields and hefty weapons. Whether you dive into Elite's world of trade or suit up for combat, the gameplay loop is pretty much the same. You do stuff to get credits and spend those credits on better equipment and ships in order to do bigger stuff and get more credits and spend those credits on even bigger and better ships and equipment. I do wish there was something to break away from this mold. I don't want to say the sentence, I wish there were more to do, because I think that would lead you to misinterpret what I'm trying to convey. Instead, I think a better sentence is, I wish there were more to experience. Content that doesn't rely on hours of circular, repetitive gameplay. Through the years, Frontiers added quasi-endgame bosses and challenges of sorts that serve as long-term goals. Beagle Point, a star system more than 65,000 light years away from Earth, is considered an achievement for any explorer able to reach it. Then there's the Thargoids, an alien species that made a surprise appearance a few years back and for whom humanity has been fighting a war against ever since. Thargoids are notoriously difficult to kill. You'll most likely need a high-end vessel outfitted with the best equipment credits can buy and a few fellow commanders crazy enough to try. Of course, in order to attempt these activities with any chance of success, we get back to Elite's harsh grind and cyclical gameplay. Elite has dozens of ships, all of which fly and feel differently. I've always found just how in-depth Elite's ships are to be oddly underrated, and again, it's something Frontier has designed within the framework of simulation, of being plausible. Learning what all your ship stats mean, both individually and collectively, is, at first, totally overwhelming. Getting the basics down, though, isn't too tough, and knowing the basics is all you need to get started. No matter what you're flying, you'll have core internal compartments, optional internal compartments, compartments and hard points. Core internal compartments are things like thrusters, armor, and your frameshift drive, which allows for jumps between star systems. These are elements every ship has. Optional internal compartments are things like cargo bays, shield generators, even fighter hangars with deployable fighters your friends can fly. Because these are optional, not all ships have access to the same optional compartments. All ships have a starting point, baseline vanilla stats you want to build on top of. As you're piecing your trusty vessel together, you'll find some ships are versatile and others more focused, rigid, and purpose. With hard points, which are your ship's weapons, core internal compartments, and optional internal compartments, you can really tweak and customize your ship's subclass. The Asp Explorer, for instance, is popular among explorers for its long jump range. Starting at a 13.12 light year per jump maximum, you can improve that range up to and beyond distances of 45 light years, which is what I have my Asp Explorer at right now. But the Asp Explorer also has plenty of optional internal compartments, so I could, plausibly, load up on cargo bays and turn my Asp, reverently named Faraday, more into a hauler than a jumper. Equipping cargo bays would decrease my jump range, but my ship would fit into another role, and if I ever wanted to switch back, I just need to unequip the cargo bays and go on my way. The Vulture, by comparison, is heavily combat-oriented. It doesn't have a lot of optional internal compartments. Using a Vulture to explore or trade is possible, but impractical. Your ship will need to reflect the business you've entered your commander into. It's good to think about ships as investments, investments that provide returns over time. All ships are pretty expensive, specifically early on. As you gain enough capital, lower tier ships can produce relatively high returns. It all depends on how you're using them. Perhaps you occasionally find your life as a trader slow when you desire a little more action. After you've accumulated an adequate amount of credits, you could purchase purchase a mid to low tier ship, outfit it for combat, and go bounty hunting. If and when your ship gets destroyed, you pay an insurance fee to rebuild your ship. This means dangerous activities, like bounty hunting, come with the risk of paying to get your ship back, which can then cut into your profits as a bounty hunter. But with enough assets backing you up, the hit you take from dying is lessened because you died in a relatively cheap mid to low tier ship. Depending on how expensive the ship you purchased is, you can hunt for bounties in a low cost ship and reap the same profit 
that you would had you purchased an outfit at a higher tier ship for combat. Evoking Jay-Z, your commander's not a businessman, you're a business, man. Elite's economy is imperfect, but it can also be beautifully complex. Star systems go through real-time ebbs and flows, their economies rise and fall. You can fly through the galaxy map and view systems by different criteria, like what kind of star it is or what goods it produces. One filter is state, which shows the health of a system. Systems can be at war, going through famine, or experience large economic growth, called a boom state. Systems in a boom state are great opportunities for traders, and once you got your ship outfitted to haul goods, learning how to read this economy is incredibly satisfying. There's a term used throughout Elite's community, Homestar, and no, it's not a reference to an early 2000s internet cartoon. Email. Because travel takes so much time, jobs that require less traveling, like mining or bounty hunting, can mostly be done within one system. Your home star is a star system that facilitates the amenities necessary for your commander to build wealth. For example, my home star was once a system called Iota Persei, a star system about 34.4 light years from Earth. Iota Persei houses a few ringed planets, and in these rings are resource extraction sites, where AI mining vessels scour the ring for minerals, and with these miners comes pirates looking for a quick shakedown. Walker City, a space station relatively close to Iota Persei's resource extraction sites, is equipped to rearm and repair ships after combat. So, after patrolling the resource extraction sites and finding and eliminating any pirates with bounties on their heads, all it takes is a quick trip back to Walker City to flip the bounties you've collected for credits and rearm and repair your ship for another round of bounty hunting. What's more is that if a pirate does get the better of you, you respawn at the closest space station to where you die, making Walker City extremely convenient. A good home star is a formula. In Iota Persei's case, a combination of resource extraction sites and a well-equipped space station within close proximity of those sites, all giving way to high profits over a relatively short amount of time. Not all space stations are well-equipped, mind you. Some don't even have standard services like refueling and repairing. Finding your home star all depends on the business you've invested your commander into and looking through the galaxy map for signs of the kind of economy you need. This process is amazing. A simulation sci-fi business ventures searching for lucrative markets across the bubble, which evolves and changes. And who knows, maybe you go on Frontier's forums or Elite's Reddit and read what other commanders have found. You ask around with other commanders about systems they've found and try them out for yourself. Word of mouth is a real legitimate tool. As you accumulate assets, your need for a centralized base of operations could subside. If you reach this point, Elite's power play mode could be a viable alternative to searching for fertile business ground. Power play itself is about as complex as the rest of the game. It really is a game within a game. The bubble's different colors represents the galaxy's different human factions, showing what territory they've conquered and who they're competing with for more territory. You can pick a faction and join the effort, partaking in various missions in order to widen your faction territory in the galaxy. All it takes to join a faction is to scroll through a menu and pick one. There aren't any matchmaking systems or waiting lobbies. I'm going to be transparent here. While I've put my fair share of hours into Elite, I haven't spent a single hour involved with Power Play, and since introducing Power Play in 2015, Frontier has continuously changed the way the mode works. This has made Power Play sort of infamous in Elite's community. Its complexity already makes it tough to talk about without playing it for an extended period of time. I just don't have enough experience playing to delve into and evaluate its nuances in any meaningful way. What I can discuss is Frontier's recent announcement that the team was looking into making power play open only. Here's what that means. In Elite, before you jump into the galaxy, you have three different options for play. Open, solo, and private. Solo means you have the whole galaxy to yourself. There won't be any other player-controlled chips anywhere. Private is a galaxy that you can invite friends to, but random players don't exist. Open is the galaxy in all its random player glory. It's essentially a public server. You can invite friends to play with you, and you may encounter random players out in space. Player versus player can happen anywhere at any time, no matter how strong anyone's ship is. Now, power play is heavily a player versus player mode. As Frontier themselves said recently, power play is fundamentally about consensual player versus player conflict. We think that pretty much all of the systems and rules would benefit from being played out in open only, as it would dramatically increase increase the chance of meeting other pledged players and being able to directly affect the outcomes of power struggles. I don't have a dog in the fight here. If Frontier designed power play to be primarily a 
PvP mode, then that's fine, but the rest of Elite doesn't require PvP to work, let alone for it to be a good game. Solo and private servers are fantastic features Elite has and continues to benefit from, and they should always stay. Another late game addition Frontier added not too long ago was the Engineers, enigmatic characters who can boost certain parts of your ship past what you're able to do with standard upgrades. The concept here is amazing. You do jobs for the Engineers, and in return they further modify your ship, pushing the limits of what's technologically and scientifically possible. There are other games with similar late game mechanics, but Elite gives players reasons to overpower their ships, whether it's upgrading weapons in order to hunt down the aforementioned Thargoids, or boosting jump distance in order to reach stars that lie far outside what's possible for standard frameshift drives. Actually, working with the engineers is complicated and ultimately kind of boring. To upgrade parts of your ship, engineers need resources. You go out, find the resources, and craft the upgrades. To reach higher tiers of engineering, allowing for even more powerful upgrades, you'll need to deliver the required number of resources multiple times. As I mentioned earlier, Fair Faraday has a max jump range of about 45 light years. To increase that, I need atypical disrupted wake echoes and chemical processors. Neither resource is something I can outright purchase, and while each resource is relatively common, all that's required to find them is just to fly around and, well, find them. Working with the engineers, at least the ones I've worked with, is inactive, unchallenging. There's no real strategy or trick. It boils down to a simple, really long fetch quest. It doesn't feel like I'm assisting a brilliant engineer create technology that exists on the edge of known science at the peak of humanity's ability. There are whole guides, player-made maps even, on farming resources for engineers. I am fully aware Elite isn't the only game to have this issue, but I don't see commonality as an excuse. I enjoy and appreciate having a way to overpower my ships and make them feel truly unique. If engineer questlines were more active and dynamic experiences, less about fetching things and something more challenging, I'd much more look forward to doing them. If there's an area where Elite's dynamics really shine, it's dogfighting. Elite's firefights are difficult, chaotic, detailed, and deadly. On the right side of your ship, you have three columns which designate how you've distributed your ship's power between systems, engines, and weapons. While exploring or trading, you won't likely need to adjust this much at all. Throw power into engines and you're good to go. In combat, these three columns each matter, and how you distribute your power depends on your fighting style as well as the ship you fly. Putting power into engines raises the top speed your ship can reach, and more quickly recharges boosts. Boosts aren't just temporary speed increases, but when used correctly, they can get you out of an enemy ship's weapon radius before they're able to fire at you. Putting power into systems means your shields recharge faster, and putting power into weapons allows you to shoot for longer periods of time before your weapons require a recharge. Dogfighting is a struggle for positioning. Your ship's scan the circle in the middle of your cockpit, gives you a reading of the objects around you as well as their position relative to you. The two lines pointing outward from the middle are your sight line. Combat is all about getting enemies in that sight line through whatever maneuvers you can muster and locking on with your weapons to fire. Whether it's flipping your ship around, moving vertically up and down, or flying in concentric circles while keeping your weapons pointed inward, combat is going to keep you moving, and it's not going to be a whole lot of straight lines. The the blue bars on your speedometer represent where your ship's highest turn radius is relative to your current top speed. You'll want to set your speed in that area in order to get maximum maneuverability and, if you're ever outmaneuvered, increase speed to get out of your enemy's sight lines. Turning flight assist off could help you evade attacks too. With flight assist off, your ship stops counterbalancing your movements. As pointed out on Elite's wiki, Sir Isaac Newton's first law of gravity is that an object in motion will stay in motion until acted upon by an external force. That's why when you throw a paper airplane, it slows down because of the air and gravity and stuff. But if you throw a paper airplane in space, it's going to fly forever, if not at least until it meets something that stops it. Likewise, with flight assist off, your ship will twist and spin and refrain from counterbalancing your input. Along with boosting, this makes your ship far more maneuverable than it is normally. You can cut sharper corners, fly in one direction while facing another, and by turning flight assist on again, 
switch directions faster. Learning to better control your ship without flight assist opens new freeform combat maneuvers that, more than anything, require player skill in order to be effective. All ships have different combat capabilities, from base hull strength to different amounts and placements of hard points. The more you fight, the more you learn which ships are tougher to fight, and what their strengths and weaknesses are, and perhaps most importantly, where their blind spots are. The Vulture, for instance, has two front-facing hard points, combining into a solid punch for anything that stands in its way. Of course, this means the Vulture has to face enemies to shoot them, which isn't true for every ship. Top of the line vessels like the Anaconda not only have more hard points, but some of its hard points sit on top of the ship, meaning weapons can hit targets above the ship as well as in front of it. Weapons themselves come in a multitude of forms, from continuous lasers to pulse lasers and even tried and true bullet tossing Gatling guns. Weapons come in different sizes and different orientations too. Gimbaled weapons will automatically follow your target as long as you're in your sight line, while static weapons only fire forward. How you fly in combat matters as much as what your enemy is flying. You'll want to engage and stay in a ship's blind spot, as well as become acquainted with the maneuverability of Elite's various ships and where their blind spots are. Remember the Vulture's limited sight lines? Well, the Vulture is also known for being relatively maneuverable. In the hands of a capable pilot, the Vulture's front-facing hardpoints are harder to evade than you might think. The dynamics in play with Elite's combat are astounding. Between ship type, weapon type, equipment, and player skill, it's a system that emphasizes experience, requiring a combination of technical skill and knowledge to master. For the most part, you'll be fighting other ships in asteroid fields in open space, which is fine, combat works there, but I'd love fights facilitated around space stations or just above the surface of planets. Elite's combat is amazing, it's incredible, but it lacks a substantial variety of setting. When you think about grand sci-fi space battles, there's all kinds of stuff going on, obstacles, debris, and other ships. If I ever had to fly and fight inside something a la Star Wars, I don't know if I'd ever play another video game for the rest of my life. Elite's combat and flight mechanics are, I think, tuned to the point that those things are possible. I just wish they were facilitated. I do notice, specifically while flying through asteroid fields, that Elite does stutter and has trouble keeping everything that's moving on screen move smoothly. I'll be honest, I don't know if it has to do with my VR setup, my PC, or some kind of optimization issue, so maybe it's something Frontier has tried and just doesn't have fine-tuned enough yet for inclusion into the game. Elite's combat may have been the element that first hooked me to the game, but what eventually became by far my favorite aspect of Elite is also the least active, exploration. Sometimes, when I explain amongst friends why Elite's exploration is so appealing to me, I feel as if I'm defending it as a game mode, because there's not much to do once you leave the bubble. You jump between star systems and see what you find, the vast majority probably filled with lifeless planets and moons. Once you're a good distance outside the bubble, there aren't space stations, battles, or territories. It's just space, the untamed cosmic wild. You'll need a fuel scoop to refuel your ship and make sure the jump routes you plot in the galaxy include star types that you can scoop. All scooping involves is flying close to a star in supercruise. It can be dangerous when done incorrectly since you're right next to a gigantic superheated ball of plasma, but keep your distance, fly slowly, and you'll be unharmed. Most stars in the galaxy are scoopable, so it's not too difficult to find fuel when you need it. What I find so enjoyable about exploration isn't the gameplay, there's not a whole lot to do to begin with. No, what appeals to me is Elite's scale. There's such a vast separation from the rest of Elite and its players when you're thousands of light years removed from the bubble. When you're driving an SRV around a random planet in the middle of some secluded nebula with a fellow commander, no worry, no care in the world. You feel as though you have the whole galaxy to yourself. You may be the first player to step foot on an entire planet, and you could very well be the last. And yet, at the same time, Elite's isolation also comes with a strange connectivity. Exploring is time-consuming, it takes hours to jump long distances, even with high-end frameshift drives, but the places you go are places other players can go too. Every planet and star and nebula exists in everyone's game. Yes, planets in Elite are mostly just rock, though you'll find plant life and other natural phenomena here and there. Through the years, Elite has filled some parts of the game 
galaxy with stuff to find, mysterious ruins, and odd alien plant life, and there's rumors that more is hiding out there somewhere. And really, I wouldn't want Frontier to fill a galaxy with tons of stuff in the first place. Again, space isn't a domain made for humanity. Elite should reflect this. The challenge of exploration should be enduring hours of jumps and stars, seeing what you can find, and maybe stumbling across a massive mountain that overlooks a planet's surface. You land, put your feet up, and know that you got there. You conquered a distance some would never dream of taking on. And there is risk in exploration. Remember, when you die, you respawn at the closest space station, and there aren't very many space stations hundreds of light years away from the bubble, let alone thousands of light years. Die once and you're back where you started. There's a tinge of danger, of peril. If and when you run across high gravity planets, do you chance landing on them or steer away? Getting to know the Milky Way and its architecture is such a joy. If you want to travel somewhere that's either above or below the galaxy's plane, you'll need to be ready for star density to drop. The farther from the galactic plane you get, the fewer stars there are, and fewer stars means fewer places to refuel and fewer destinations to jump to, making plotting your course a bit trickier. Elite's Milky Way is magnificent, mapped to some extent after the real Milky Way. You'll find actual stars, nebulae, and other objects humanity knows exist. You can find and travel to famous stars such as V.Y. Canis Majoris, Sir Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse being a star you can see in the night sky with the naked eye. Soon after astronomers discover the Trappist-1 star system, an actual real-life star system with seven Earth-sized planets about 40 light years away from Earth, Frontier put the system in the game, and you can go check it out if you want. Your skybox changes relative to where you are in the galaxy. Each star you see around you is a star on the galaxy map. There aren't any fillers. Fly toward a nebula and it'll eventually dominate a portion of space giving a glow to the emptiness around you. There's more work to be done on the galaxy, there's no denying that. A quick flight through the galaxy map and you'll quickly begin to spot the same four or five nebula models. Some nebulas, like Bernard's Loop or the Pleiades, are modeled after what they look like in real life. Replacing the placeholder models is high on my list of things I'd like Frontier to change about the galaxy, though they've certainly been making strides over the past few years. My list for Elite, of course, extends beyond exploration. There are numerous tweaks Frontier could make that would go a long way in improving Elite. I could carry on forever with miscellaneous structural and gameplay changes I'd want to see. Like, why can't I see a space station's inventory before landing there? Inventories from station to station are different, which is fine and realistic, but if I'm searching for a specific part, why can't I look it up in a digital space Amazon, compare prices and distances, and choose? Also, right Right now, I can go online, customize a car, compare prices, and make a purchase. It would be a huge help to have something similar in Elite, where I can look up a ship, outfit it with various gadgets and equipment, and decide if I want to purchase it after seeing the full price. Elites come a long way, and it has yet a long way to go. Being able to walk around on your ship and fly through planets that have atmospheres are big additions players have wanted since the game launched. Frontier recently said Elite's next big update wouldn't be ready until the latter part of 2020, saying that update, whatever it is, would be a defining moment in the history of the game and the biggest update yet. I love Elite Dangerous, even if there are things I also hate about it. It's a game unlike any other, and and while problems persist, some extremely annoying, I've loved the time I put into it, and I tend to have an optimistic outlook for its future moving forward. In any case, I've got 27 units of tech that needs hauling over to Tanner City and V886 Centauri, so I can't talk much more. I'll see you around, perhaps somewhere out in the galactic vastness of our own Milky Way. Thank you.